friends, have I got a video for you from our UK Parliament. An MP called Nick Fletcher brought uh, through what we call the Backbench Business Committee um, a debate on Christianity in society. Uh, and hopefully and pray this gets into the Houses of Parliament. And, and in this talk that you're going to see, he talks about the state of Christianity in the UK at the moment. And then he shares the gospel. It is amazing. And then speaks in response to a couple of questions uh, from other MPs. One, Fiona Bruce, who's also a Christian. And then from Sir Edward Lee, who asks him a question. He speaks about his faith and how he treats other parliamentarians. It is so powerful. I pray that you watch it all the way through and pray that this topic of Christianity in society goes into the main chamber in the House of Commons and is debated because this is so important as society turns away from Christianity. We need to put it right back at the centre. Let's watch what this guy, Nick Fletcher, has to say. Enjoy. <laughs> The church and Christianity and the interpretation of the Bible have been in the news more than normal as of late. Recently, the census showed that fewer people identify as Christian. The Church of England has been debating well-known ethical teaching that is now considered controversial in a liberal, modern, united kingdom. Many institutions seem to want to erase any references to their Christian heritage. The London School of Economics recently stated that it will be dropping Easter, Christmas and Michaelmas from their academic calendar. This Easter, the giant bunny will no doubt return once again to my Westminster Hotel lobby, but I am sure there will be no sign of a cross. In conversations everywhere, the Lord's name is taken in vain and no one bats an eyelid. Mm. The rainbow was long understood to represent God's promise to never again flood the earth. I wonder how many people are even aware of that now. Religious literacy has been declining for decades. Every Christmas and Easter, the newspapers will report some new poll showing that fewer and fewer people understand even the most basic claims of the Christian faith. And the basic historical and legal facts about our Christian heritage and our Christian constitution are receding from our collective cultural understanding. The question is, does it matter? Well, I want to suggest two reasons why it does. Firstly, for constitutional and cultural reasons, and secondly, from a faith point of view. Throughout British history, the Christian Church has pioneered some of the most profound and positive social changes to ever bless these islands. Here, as in many other parts of the world, Christians led the way with universal education and health care. As the historian Tom Holland and many others have recognised, so many of the laws and values that we now take for granted have their roots firmly in the Christian faith. It was the biblical idea of God as the ultimate lawgiver that underpinned the Magna Carta, providing the foundation stone of individual freedom and establishing the principle that no one, not even the king, is above the law. Many of our laws are based around the tablets given to Moses on Mount Sinai and the ethical teaching of the Old and New Testaments. The great biblical institution of marriage is recognised by social science for the emotional and material blessing it brings to spouses and their children. The Christian faith is woven into the social and physical fabric of the United Kingdom. The beautiful and symbolic Church buildings across this land with their tall steeples reaching for the heavens are part of our history and culture, not just our skyline. This place in which we stand today took its name from the noble Abbey Church of St Peter's, the Minster in the West. The bishops play their part in the House of Lords, reflecting hundred year, hundreds of years of having an established church. Prayers are said every day in chambers of both houses. Above each entrance to central lobby, the patron saints from all four parts of our United Kingdom are celebrated in murals. And the tiled floor contains the words of Psalm 127. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, its yes. builders labour in vain. Yes. At the coronation, His Majesty the King will be anointed in the name of God as Supreme Governor of the Church of England, as well as Head of State. The St Edward's crown placed on his head contains a cross and orb symbolising the King and our world under the authority of God. Many people who don't have a personal faith in Christ still value this history and the benefits it has given us. Of course, some want to rewrite history, but everywhere you look, you see our Christian heritage, and no more than in this place. So it matters to our national life. It is the air we breathe. Although many deride and misrepresent it, the reality is it has been a source of great benefit. Much of what makes Britain great stems from this heritage, and many others from around the world recognise this. So why don't we? We should be proud of our Christian history and our Christian values. It will be a constitutional disaster to try and erase it. But even worse, it will be a spiritual disaster. Which brings me on to the main reason we should cherish the Christian faith, because I, as many others, believe it is true. Let me speak of the basics of Christianity. The foundational premise of the gospel is that we are all sinners. We do wrong. Wrong against God. Wrong against one another. And we know it. I know it. I'm not proud of it, but it is true. I think if we were really all truthful with ourselves, we all would admit we are not the good people we'd like to think we are. We might not be all out stealing and assaulting people, However, I'm sure we have all said things we wish we hadn't said. Done things we wish we hadn't done. We've been unkind instead of kind. Greedy instead of generous. We've broken promises instead of keeping them. We've told lies instead of telling the truth. We've done the things as parents or partners that we know we shouldn't have. In the Old Testament, they covered their sins with sacrifices. Their prized lamb or goat sacrificed to God. But God knew we were never going to be able to meet his hopes for our lives. And this is where the events of Easter happened. John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. At Christmas, we celebrate Christ's birth. He came into the world as a unique person, one who is fully human, like us, but also divine and therefore perfect and sinless. On Good Friday, we remember the cross where Jesus was sacrificed to cover our sins. And then on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead to sit at the right-hand side of God, defeating death for the sake of everyone who believes in him. The Christians who have had such a great influence on the life of this nation knew these things to be true because they are written in the pages of the world's best-selling book, the Holy Bible. Those of us who believe in this book may not perfectly understand it. We may even sadly sometimes misuse it. But it is still true and it is still perfect. And with the help of God's Holy Spirit, anyone can understand it. It's not a religion that is only open to clever people. In fact, one of the reasons the Christian faith is sometimes derided and rejected is because it's disproportionately a religion for the kind of people that elites look down on. The poor, the weak, the uneducated. But as the Bible itself says, God uses the weak to shame the strong. The Bible is a book of truth, love and grace. A book written by God through his chosen people. A book that gives someone like me the promise of eternal life and wise guidance about how to be a better person. I became a Christian in my mid-thirties. I knew of Christ many years before, but never thought I was good enough. I was right. I wasn't. The Bible is shockingly plain that we cannot make ourselves good enough for God, no matter how many good deeds we try to do. But that is the beauty of Christianity and the Easter Easter story. Forgiveness is given to us by God, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And this good news is offered to everyone 
everywhere. All our sins, past and present, are forgiven once we make that decision. Let me tell you, it's a wonderful feeling to be forgiven. (laughs) Blessed and certain of the promise of eternal life. It's wonderful knowing my maker is with me at all times. Right here, right now. With me in my triumphs. There have been a few. (laughs) But more importantly, with me in the dark times too. I couldn't do this job without my faith. I would have had some lonely walks over Westminster Bridge to my hotel after a long, difficult day without God at my side. Now, I'm not sure how this speech will be received. Some people are very hostile to the idea of Christian politicians. So let me try and reassure you. The two greatest instructions are taught in Luke 10, 27. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. And he said, my neighbour is everyone in here, from all parties and everyone out there too. Now that doesn't mean I have to agree with them, thank goodness for that, but it does say that I must love them. He he asks, um, or he says he's not sure how his speech will be received. I've been just about 13 years in this house and um, I have never been more moved listening to a speech. Uh, He echoes so much of my own experience. I became a a, a Christian when I was 27 and um, it changed my life. It gave my life meaning and purpose Um, and as he says, to know that we are so loved by someone who was willing even to send his son to die on a cross and would have done so had we been the only person in the world. Um, I'd just like to put on record my appreciation for um, the Honourable Member's um, bravery in uh, speaking so boldly and so clearly um, about his faith. I believe it echoes the faith of many, many others in this face and across this country, in this place and across this country. Um, It humbles me uh, to consider that perhaps over 13 years I should have been bolder and braver, but I thank him for what he has done and said today. Thank my honourable friend, and uh, she's one of the boldest people and bravest that I know here, so thank you very much. Could I intervene again? I just want to uh, echo what my honourable friend has said. It's a very moving and beautifully written yes. speech, which we, serve, which we never hear normally in this place. I just wonder whether he wants to comment. I think a lot of politicians who may have religious belief are very frightened of talking about it because they think they will put themselves on a pedestal. And when inevitably they fail, or if the worst comes to worst, there's some scandal, they are doubly denounced. But I'm not sure that that is a good reason for not talking up about your faith, because the way the Honourable Gentleman is talking about his faith, he admits that he constantly fails, that he's a sinner and all those sort of things. So even if he now, he does fail in the future, there's, that's absolutely no reason why he shouldn't talk about his faith publicly. Mm-hmm. Thank my Honourable Friend. At the beginning of the speech, I always, I've known about Christianity all my life. I was brought up in a Christian home, but I didn't want to make that commitment because I never thought I was good enough. Mm -hmm. I thought the mistakes I made would be too many and a Christian person should be this wonderful person that has a halo. Uh, As you you realise and as you learn about the Bible, you realise that that's not true. And it's because I make mistakes that I became a Christian. I'll go back again. I hope I've not offended anybody. I hope I've given a true account of the need for Christianity as a nation and as individuals. The West as a whole is under threat from many foreign aggressors, and many a commentator is saying the West is under threat from itself. Whether we see Christianity as part of our history, or whether we embrace it as our own personal faith, it matters to all of us. Whether or not we are believers, our way of life is built on Christianity. And to let it fall by the wayside, thinking it does not matter, I believe will be a terrible mistake. I thank you for listening today. I hope some of those watching and listening 
have learned something new about the great history of our nation. But most of all, I hope they have heard the Christian message of faith, hope and love, and that some of them might start on the same wondrous journey as I did with God at their side.